John chapter 2. Um, let's see. I'll begin reading at verse 24. I'll read verses 24 uh, and 25, and then we'll get into our study. 1 John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. I'm going to keep reading. Um, These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and it's not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And so I'm going to review a few things as I normally do and then lead into our study that we'll be looking at as we're going to be looking at verses 24 through 29. As we've been going through 1 John in the second chapter, John has warned the church about deception. Deception has been entering into the congregations. In verse 18 of chapter 2, he had said, Antichrist is coming, but even now he said there are many antichrists. The last days, in other words, is going to be filled with antichrists, and and that would be what led to the revelation of the final antichrist, whom we refer to as the antichrist. So the deception is going to be one of the conditions that is existing in the last days. Even remember with me how Jesus was speaking to his man as they were leaving the temple area. He had stated that all these stones would be uh, uh, brought down and all his men were concerned concerning these things. When is this going to happen? Where's the signs of, of your coming? And all they asked him. And he said, take heed that no one deceives you. So the very first evidence of the last days is going to be deception. So John speaks concerning the same way because deception will be the condition existing in the last days. In 2 Peter, the apostle Peter in chapter 2 verse 1 said, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. There were false prophets, there will be false teachers among you. Paul in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 said, The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So these antichrists are actually paving the way for the final antichrist. He says they are deceivers. They are false teachers engaging in efforts to lead believers astray. In verse 19, he had said that they went out from us, but they were not of us. They were never, in other words, genuinely saved. He said they went out, they departed. They departed from the congregation of believers. In other words, they attended church, but were never saved. Just because they were members, we'll say, of the fellowship didn't mean that they were actually saved because, he said in verse 19, had they been saved, they would have remained in in doctrine, apostolic doctrine. You see, a genuine believer abides in fellowship in God's word with other Christians. And those who are genuine believers will continue in the things of God. In John 8, 31, Jesus said it like this. He said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So a false teacher will leave the church family, and he also often will take people with him. The departure from the truth and fellowship will unmask them as deceivers. Now, were these people that he's referring to, were they at one time actual genuine Christians? John is saying they're not. Why? Because a genuine believer continues in Christ, abides in him. So those who turn away from the Lord only have a slight and passing taste of the gospel. They have not partaken fully in salvation. In John 6, 53 through 56, Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day, for my my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. In other words, fully assimilating by faith the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just having a passing knowledge of him or the capacity to answer questions that come out of a catechism but having an actual real relationship with God. It speaks of abiding in Christ. So those who have been saved abide in Christ, and they don't forsake him. In 2 John, in verse 9, John said, Anyone who runs ahead and doesn't continue in the teaching of Christ doesn't have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So when God is moving, it's inevitable that, that deceivers will enter in order to undermine, because the enemy always attempts to destroy the work of God. Sometimes people will begin to attend a church, and they bring false doctrine with them. Sometimes members of the church begin to be influenced by error and then begin to influence others to error. And when that's not addressed, what happens is the false teaching gains a foothold. That's why systematic teaching that's rightly divided is so important. It provides safety for the young and growing believers. So when this occurs, false teachers, wolves, are exposed. Through teaching the word of God, the bad doctrine is exposed for what it is. Now he had said in verse 20, you have an anointing from the Holy One. You know all things. A real comfort comes from knowing that the Holy Spirit is on duty. In John 16, verse 13, Jesus said it like this. He said, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So John isn't providing information that they're not aware of. Verse 21 made that clear. He's simply saying those who remain in heresy are manifesting they never were saved. In verse 22, he had asked who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist. So that's the test of orthodoxy. Who is Jesus Christ? Is Jesus God in human flesh? You see, the denial of Jesus' humanity struck at the very heart of the incarnation. The incarnation, God taken upon himself, human flesh, was so important that John began his gospel with it. Remember in John chapter 1, verse 1, how it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was was God. In John 1, 14, he went on to say, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is presented very clearly in scripture as God in the flesh. The apostle Paul wrote that Jesus is God in the flesh. In Colossians 1, verse 19, Paul said, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. In Colossians 2, verse 9, he said, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In 1 Timothy 3, 16, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And finally, the Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews writes the same thing. In Hebrews 1, verse 6, it says, When he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. In verse 8 of Hebrews 1, But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. I say all of that to remind you that the Gnostic influ influencers, the infiltrators, were teaching that Jesus was not God. So John is making it clear that that is error. That's why in verse 23, he said, whoever denies the son does not have the father either. The word deny speaks of rejecting. Whoever rejects Christ doesn't have God. So to deny Jesus is to be antichrist. The only way to know the true God is to come through Jesus Christ because to have Jesus is to have God. When people will say to you, that they're a believer in God, but not a believer of Jesus, John's answer would be then they're not a believer in the true God. To have Christ is to have God. To reject Christ is to not have God. In John 5, 23, um, second portion, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So to deny this revelation is to deny the, to deny the word of God. So that brings us up to verse 24. And that's where we'll begin our study. So he continues by saying, verse 24, Therefore, 
let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Hold on to the teachings you have received about who God is. Build your life, he's saying, on this revelation. Remain firmly committed to what you know. If this teaching concerning Jesus and who he is abides in you, he's saying you're safe. So remain rooted and grounded in God's revelation. Be faithful to remain in it and be faithful to guard it from any alteration. He had said in 1 John 2, verse 5, whoever keeps or guards his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. So be faithful to remain in the word of God and what God reveals about Christ and guard it from alteration. Let God's revelation of Jesus Christ abide in you. May that revelation guide you. May that revelation teach you. May that revelation empower you. And he goes on in verse 25. This is the promise that he's promised us. Eternal life. God cannot lie. And God has made promises. God has made promises to believers. And God's promise of eternal life is realized when we abide in him. You know, Jesus on one occasion had stated that we are to be like little children. If we don't become like little children, we're not going to enter into the kingdom of God. And one of the things that comes to mind, even as I'm looking at this about little children, is they never forget a promise. Anybody who is a parent knows that. If you promise your kids something, they'll remind you. They will remind you about it. They never forget a promise. For some reason, they never remember promises of getting spanked if you don't do something. But they do remember the promises you made that you're going to give them something. Children have that ability. That's what they remember. That's what they concentrate on. And, and, and John uh, often calls us his beloved children or little children. That's those who are reading his letter, my beloved children, my little children. That's a, a term of endearment from a rabbi to, to one of his students. And it's something that's very dear. And he's telling them, these are things that you need to remember. You need to remember God's promises to you. You need to hold fast because God is not a liar. God doesn't take his word back. He's going to hold fast to what he said. And if he made these promises, he'll keep these promises. And the promise he's given to you is eternal life. And that, that promise is realized when you rest in him and abide in him, when you trust in him, trusting the one who cannot lie. And when you do that, that results in life. In John's gospel, chapter 5, verse 24, he said it like this. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. John 6, verse 40, for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. John 6, 47, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. Those are his promises. And these are the things that we, that we hold fast to. And that's what he's saying in verse 25. This is the promise that he promised us, eternal life. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to strive to attain it. I just have to believe him and receive it. I just have to know that he doesn't lie. And what he has said, he will do. And if he's promised me that if I commit myself to him, if I repent for my sin, ask for his forgiveness, receive him as my savior, open my heart, that his spirit might dwell in me, I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I have eternal life. It's not based on anything I've done. It's not by works of righteousness, which I have done. It's, it's his mercy. He's done it for us, and that's what we rejoice in. And I can accept that promise. Now, in verse 26, he says, These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. I mentioned to you that there are a few reasons that John has written. He wanted us to have joy. He said that in chapter 1. This is the second reason. He says, I've written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Concerning those who are leading you away or leading you astray. He's writing to safeguard his readers, which would include us, by the way, from deception. The word deception is a word that speaks of seduction. Uh, it's a spiritual seduction, deception. These deceivers do all they can, he's saying, to confuse you. So I am writing 
to expose them. I'm warning you because they're trying to lead you astray. Because these people are false teachers, they are also antichrists. So as an apostle and as a shepherd, John loved God's word and God loved, uh, John loved God's people. You know, when, when you love God's word and you're a shepherd, not only do you love teaching, but you love those whom you teach. I've said this before. It always comes to mind when I think of this. Uh, my mom told me one day, you know, David, I love, I love, I love sharing the word. It's people I can't stand. And, and I remember t- telling my mama, well, mama, you've got it wrong there because y- you can't love doing something. You have to love those whom you are giving the word to. It's not just talking. It's loving those people. You see, as an apostle, he loved the people. He was a shepherd. He was God's sheepdog, if you will. And he protected the sheep from the wolves. He was openly revealing who they were, by the way, by specifically identifying them. We live in an odd time, and it's not just now. It's been for a while where people begin, even in churches like this, will get upset if the pastor happens to mention the name of a, of a teacher that you ought to be aware of. For some reason, um, the church is hypersensitive. I think the, I think the um, spirit of this age has influenced a lot of believers. And instead of that believer appreciating hearing, be careful for this guy's teaching error, instead of them appreciating it, they get upset and say, you're judging them. But Jesus said, judge righteous judgment. There's nowhere in scripture that says I shouldn't have discernment. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that I should just allow people to lie to me because it's okay because I'm really loving them when they do. If somebody was trying to take out one of my little girls and I knew that they were a dog, not a nice person, if I said to them, to them you know what, um, that guy's okay, I wouldn't be a real father or grandfather. See, I'm, I'm done with uh, having to raise my girls. Now they can make as many mistakes as they want. But when they were under my roof, I had the responsibility of protecting them. So I would say, I don't really think so. I don't think that person's good for you. Oh, Dad, you just don't know him. I don't want to know him. (laughs) I know enough. I see myself in him. Every, Every man knows what I just said. I see myself in him before I got saved. I know a con when I see one, and you be careful. You be careful with that one because they're telling you things that they think you want to hear. By the way, seduction is simply having somebody tell you the things they know you want to hear. That's how you're seduced. It can go with male, female, either way. That's how you're seduced. A guy gets to know a girl. A guy guy who's a little experienced in life at all and I, I'll be careful not to go too far now because my mind's traveling down uh, this and probably shouldn't, but I'll do it anyway for a minute. Um, it only takes you a few minutes in the first conversation, a guy with a girl, to know her weakness. It doesn't take any time at all. Guys, am I telling you uh, these women a lie? It's the truth. It only took you a few minutes to figure her out. What is it she likes? What is it she doesn't like? What does she want to hear? How should I say it? You're already generating that in your head. You'll say something. She won't react the way you think she should, so you say something. You finally find the weak spot. And once you find that weak spot, that's where you stay. That's how seduction happens. That's how it happens. You figure them out. You find their weakness. You promise them things they want to hear, and eventually you seduce them. That happens. That's a fact. That's how it works. And so mental seduction, spirit, spiritual seduction is the same thing. <clears throat> it, it, it's, it's knowing what they want to hear. What do they want to hear? They want to hear this. So they say that. And what happens is they end up making a lot of money and they steal your soul. That's what they do. I could start giving you names of people that you're all familiar with already that you have to be careful with. People who look like they're telling you the truth. But in fact, are tinting that 
that word with things that are incorrect. Anytime a man does not rightly divide the word of God, anytime a man stands up as if he is the authority without giving you scripture, giving you cross-reference, pointing you why this is, that's somebody to be careful with because they take the place of the authority of scripture. You have to be careful with that. That's why I teach the way I do. I'll give you scripture. I'll give you cross-reference. Go look it up. See if I'm rightly dividing. If I'm not, correct me because... I have to do that. As a shepherd and a sheepdog, that's what I do. So Paul is, is uh, rather John, is telling them that these are the things they need to be careful with. Now, sometimes you'll identify. In Romans 16, 17, and 18, Paul said it like this, and I'm going to take this apart for you. He said, I urge you, brethren, <clears throat> note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Romans 16, 17, 18. I'm going to take this apart for you just to show you something. Paul urged, when he says that, I urge, that word urge, Paul exhorted them to note. The word note means be aware of those who cause, who create divisions, dissension and disunity, and offenses, which are snares, contrary to the doctrine or the teaching they had learned. He said, avoid, turn away from them. For those who are such of this sort do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, their own appetites or hearts by smooth. Smooth words are kind words or plausible talk and flattering speech. The word flattering means praise. They deceive completely seduce the hearts, which speaks of thoughts or feelings of the simple, the innocent, the naive, or those without guile. He is saying these people infiltrate and deceive the innocent. Watch out for them. He said, make note of them. Be aware of them because they're going to take you down a path that you should not go to. Over the years, I've been very careful to, to, when necessary, to share with our church, be careful with these teachers. Look out for these teachers. Many of those whom you see on television today are not giving you the genuine gospel. Many of those whom you may hear on a radio station are not really giving to you the word of God properly. Be aware of that and always be willing to check them out to see whether the things they're saying are true or not. And so you have that responsibility. But notice verse 27. He says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it's true, it's not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. As believers, he's saying, you have received an anointing. You've received the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you read your Old Testament, kings and priests and prophets would be anointed for service to the Lord. John is saying that believers have received an anointing of the Spirit. In 1 Peter, the apostle Peter said in chapter 2, verse 5, he said, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So in the face of this deception that is infiltrating the churches, Paul is, uh, rather John is saying, I am confident that the Spirit will safeguard you. You have received apostolic doctrine. You are grounded in God's word. And the Spirit will enable you to discern false doctrine. You have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will safeguard and the Holy Spirit will teach. In John 14, 26, it says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. I wonder how many of us in this room, when we first got saved, were approached by somebody bringing false doctrine. I wonder. I was. I remember it very well the first time. I remember it very well. I hadn't been a Christian more than a week or two. And there was a knock on the door. 
I answered the door. There were two people standing at the door telling me things that, uh, that they believed. And they said, we are uh, Christian witnesses who are going door to door to share the gospel with people. And they were Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and I, I didn't know a thing about Jehovah's Witnesses other than my grandmother was a Jehovah's Witness, but she never spoke to me about anything. And so I didn't know what they were talking about. So I said, oh, really? They said, yes, we are Jehovah's Christian Witnesses. I said, are you really? And they said, yeah. I said, well, you know what? Now you have to picture this. I was a hippie, so I had the long hair. I was wearing a Japanese robe with dragons on it, you know, in round hippie glasses and bushy sideburns and barefoot, you know, with jeans and just, just a hippie. And I'm standing there, and they're looking at me, and so, you know, we're Jehovah's Christian witnesses, they said. And I said, you're Christians? I don't know the difference. I'm brand new in the Lord. I'm two weeks old. Yes, we're Christians. So am I. And I got really excited because I was taught that you're supposed to be, well, if they're Christians, aren't they? Fa- I, you know, I didn't know anything about truth or error yet. But when they started speaking to me, and at first, you know, they didn't really want to. They were kind of freaked at me. But... And I was real exuberant. And so they finally started trying to share things with me. I still remember this. I don't remember what they're saying, but I do remember how I responded. I remember looking at them as they were speaking. And when they finished sharing with me what it was that they wanted me to know, I said, you know, I don't think I agree with you. I said, I just don't. I don't think what you're saying is, is true, is accurate. I wasn't. Arguing, arguing with them, I was just saying, I just don't think so. I had no idea that that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was giving to me, a brand new believer, a sense that this, there's something wrong with what they're saying. That's what John is saying. The Spirit is within you. He gives you discernment. You'll, you'll hear something. It sounds wrong because it is wrong. And that's why Jesus had said to us that the Spirit will teach us all things and bring to our remembrance the things that he said. So I trust the Holy Spirit. I trust the Holy Spirit who will awaken us and say to us, that's, that's not true. That's not in my word. Obviously, we should stay in the word and know the word. But there are times when the Holy Spirit is just on duty like that and awakens us to it. In verse 28, he said, now little children abide in him. And when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Abide in him, dwell in him. Abiding in him produces security, and it gives us confidence for our future. When he says abide, that means remain vitally connected to Jesus, the true vine. In John 15, 4 and 5, Jesus said, remain in me, abide in me, as I also abide or remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So abiding in Christ and in his word is the antidote to false belief and ungodly behavior. Persevering in Christ is the evidence that you're a genuine Christian. So you continue in his word. You continue in fellowship. And you continue in fellowshipping with his children. Now notice in verse 28, it says, when he appears. That word appears simply means when he is made visible or when he's seen. Abiding in Christ causes us not to fear his return. As we love him and serve him, We live in confident assurance that we'll see him. And when he appears, we will see him as he is. We'll see that in later chapters. And when the rapture occurs, we're going to go and be with him. Now, false teachers have no confidence. They're going to be ashamed. That word ashamed, when he speaks about it there in verse 28, means to be openly disgraced or being put to shame by Jesus. Why is that? Because... Jesus' return will mean judgment and rejection of them. And then he says in verse 29, if you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. If you know that he is righteous, you know that the one practicing righteousness is of him. If you know that he's righteous, one, God is righteous. 
We see that all through scripture. I just give you a couple of verses. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Psalm 11, verse 7. The Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. Isaiah 5, 16. The Lord of hosts will be exalted in judgment, and the holy God will show himself holy in righteousness. So if you know he is righteous, well, since God is righteous, it follows that his children live righteously. God's children don't practice and don't live in sin. God's children live pure lives. You see, some of the false teachers had been teaching that believers could remain in sin because they believed that physical actions did not impact spiritual reality. And so they taught that the spirit would not be corrupted by fleshly works. For them, that meant that someone could sin, but it wouldn't affect their spiritual selves. Well, John had said that's, that's error. He had said in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If he is righteous, it, 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 it goes without saying his children will be righteous also because we are his children. So those who are saved no longer practice sinful lifestyles. You turned away from it. You turned away from sin. You confessed it. You received forgiveness. And the scripture says in Psalm 119, verse 3, as a result, they do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You see, if you don't want to be ashamed, then be made righteous through Christ. Because the fruit of regeneration will be a life that is earmarked by righteousness. And true righteousness is only possible if someone has been born again. Again, we're going to receive communion in a moment, so I want to be careful with the time. You are all know, we are all known by something. Every one of us in this room has a reputation. Every one of us is known for something. I was sharing with a friend of mine just the other day how that when I first got saved, I had the opportunity to go up north to a place called Pacific Grove. I had a friend of mine. His name was Paul. We used to call him Woody. He was a surfer, so we called him Woody because of his, of his um, loving to surf and all. And so anyway, I went to see Paul, and uh, I took two friends. Two friends and I went up there, two Christian friends, and I went up to see Paul up in Pacific Grove. And I went specifically as a new Christian to share with Paul, who was an old friend of mine, that Jesus had saved me. I wanted him to know that. So we got in my car. We drove all the way up to a Pacific Grove over there by, it's by Monterey up north. And I remember pulling in, knocking on his apartment door, and my friends and I standing there, and Paul comes to the door, and he says, Dave, it's great to see you. He says, come on in. So we go in, and we sit down. As we're seated there in his living room, uh, he says, I, I wanted to uh, introduce a some friends of mine that I know up here, I wanted to introduce uh, you to them. They'll be here in a few moments. And I said, great. So I'm just sitting there, not talking to them yet, just kind of, you know, just passing the time until the, the guys showed up. And, and when they finally did arrive, there were two of them, they came in, sat down, and this is how Paul introduced me. I'll never forget it. He said, guys, this is David, my friend from high school. David is a guy who got me loaded for my very first time. That's how I was known. And he was right. But David is the guy who got me loaded for the very first time. That's how I was remembered by him. And that's what he told his friends. You have friends who will introduce you in a certain way. What are they going to introduce you as? So when he said that to me, I looked at him and I said, Paul, this is what I told him. I'm a brand new Christian, but I said to him, Paul, I introduced you to drugs. That's true. But I've come up here so I might introduce you to Jesus Christ because he has saved my life. And so I wanted to present to him that which changed my life. And that's what we do, right? 
And so you're known in a certain way. You are known for your lifestyle. We know that. We have reputations. Everybody has one. Everybody has a reputation. They'll call you by your nickname. A lot of people have nicknames. There are a reason for those nicknames that they gave to you. You know, little savage. <laughs> Sad girl. <laughs> anyway, they, there, are, there are names. That was a characteristic of yours. They gave you a nickname. Jesus gave nicknames. You know, when you look at Thomas, Thomas is called Didache. You know, he is the twin. Um, Simon Peter had different names. You know, the rock. You know, he's rocky. You know, Cephas. And there, there are different names that you find in Scripture. Um, there are names that were given to you that would expose your um, who you are. And, and what is your nickname? What do people know you as, you know? I would, I would like people to not know my past. I, I want them to know what God has done now. I, I want them to see me as, as a changed person, not the same person, right? And so you have a reputation. It's something to be aware of. It's something to, to, to know. It's something to, to, to um, allow to, to inspire you to be an influence to other people. What is, your, what is your reputation? May you have a reputation amongst those who know you as being righteous, as being a person who loves the Lord. May that be your reputation, that people know that about you. We don't walk in the way that we used to. You see, if you don't want to be ashamed, then you're made righteous and be made righteous through Christ. That's the fruit of regeneration. And again, true righteousness is only possible if you've been born again. And when that happens, you have no fear of final judgment. In Romans 8, 1 and 2, Paul said it like this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's us. See, I, I don't fear final judgment. I don't have a fear in my heart for that. Because I have passed from death into life. Because of Christ, I have been born again. And somebody says, well, you know, you're putting, you're, you're, how do you know that? How, you're taking it, what if what you believe, and they've said this to me, what if what you believe is just a joke? It's not even true. You wasted your whole life. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Because when I turn around and I look at my life from before I came to Christ and where it is now, there's no comparison at all. Prior to Christ, there was sorrow and, and hurt and shame and, Sin and regrets. And since Christ has been washed away and God has replaced so much with joy, with blessings, friends. Even if it weren't true, and it is, but even if it were not true, I've had a great life. I've had a great life. God has been present every step of the way. And he's given to me a beautiful wife and and beautiful grandchildren and four kids. And it's. <laughs> and the best is yet to come. And the best is yet to come. Because one day I get to see him face to face. There is therefore no condemnation. Walk with the Lord and you won't be afraid. Again, if you know that he is righteous you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. You can tell if somebody is walking with God if they live a righteous life. Father, we ask.